I really don't know what kind of makes me tend to want to call you Rachel Katie Rogers. It might be your last name. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Uh, should not happen. It did happen. Uh, in our little church plant, uh, like a year back, we had this uh, girl coming back to the same area which she grew up in. Her name is Yvonne. And she, I talked to her today on the phone because I was so excited. I got to lead the meeting where Katie Rogers was going to talk. And she was like, oh my goodness. Well, kind of. Uh, by the way, Yvonne, there you are. You're watching on Vimeo or whatever streaming service provides that. So uh, we are so honored to have you here. And I'm very excited to, to sit there while you're standing here. Uh, please come. Please come. So Katie has been leading children's ministry in, in more like, like more than 10 years in, in Belfast Vineyard. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. 10 years this year. 10 years. I should hold the microphone to you when you speak. Uh, actually, I'm just going to give it away. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. Uh, just as I, I prayed for tonight, um, I just always get the sense when I start to share my heart that, that the Holy Spirit comes and starts to do something. And it's just from that little verse that's in um, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, where it talks about how um, the hearts of the fathers are turned to the children and the children to their fathers. So if you feel something happening to you during the course of, of the evening, that, that's what's happening, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. And I just get a sense that right across the room that this will happen, um, and you'll feel like it's like almost an actual physical thing in your heart, so just um, pay attention to it and be talking to Jesus. So, let me tell you a little bit about my journey to becoming a children's pastor. Uh, we're in a church in Belfast now. Um, I've been there for 10 years since all about 40 people when I started, so it's been a lot of fun watching it, watching it grow. I used to be a teacher. I taught special needs children, uh, four to six year olds, mainly with autism and behavioral difficulties. And I did not want to do children's ministry on a Sunday morning at all. And I felt that I worked with children all week long. And that on a Sunday, I just wanted to do something that was completely different to that. And it didn't matter how often people told me that I was gifted with children or that I should be there or even that they needed help. I was not going to go there. And I'm quite stubborn. And I had in my head this perception of what Sunday school was like. And I really didn't want to go there because as far as I was concerned, it was bad enough that I had to spend my entire childhood in it without keeping going to the kids' rooms as an adult. Um, in Northern Ireland, where I grew up, uh, everybody goes to church really as a child, whether you're a Christian or not. There's a big Sunday school tradition. So even if your parents didn't go to church, you got put on the bus and sent um, in the hope that you'd at least pick up some good behaviors on the way. Uh, and that was my experience. Um, it wasn't a good one. And yeah, so as I said, I began my career as a special needs teacher. And I absolutely loved my job. Does anybody love their job? I loved it. Oh my. I got to work every morning. And I was so excited to be there. It's a bit sickening, really. But yeah, I just loved it. And I just walk about smiling, and I'm totally a morning person, so um, that was probably even worse. And I had a career plan, you know. I adored my job, and I was really good at it. Um, and I knew that I was. And I only, the only reason I trained to be a teacher was that I had this great plan that I was going to be a head teacher of a school and then progress onwards um, and uh, maybe some sort of educational politics. That was the plan. And I had this great idea that by the time I was 28, I was going to be the youngest head teacher that there ever was um, and try and fast track that. And I had picked up my application to train to be a head teacher 
when I heard the Lord for the first time very clearly tell me to leave. And this is what happened. One night I had a dream, you know, I'd said to the Lord, I can't leave because these children are so special and so precious and I just can't leave. And I had this dream and God showed me the kids in the school that I worked in. And these are children with severe and profound learning difficulties. And he just gave me this picture of how um, that they were in the arms of their father in heaven. But then he showed me the kids in our church and on the streets around our church, and they were slowly dying. And I just woke up crying, and I knew that the Lord was telling me to go to them. So that he was speaking to me, you know, just tell these little ones about me. You need to pray salvation onto them. You need to introduce these children to me. Just go. So naturally, this being very far away from my career agenda, I ignored it for a good while. But then, one week, I started listening to some talks that were by Jackie Pullinger. Uh, I'm sure most of you will have probably read her books or heard her speak. And she works in Hong Kong with the poor. And my heart just started to break. And that week I began to pray. And I remember deliberately asking God, would you please start showing me the people in poverty in our city? So that Sunday, I went to our church and sat down to a sermon that was once again based on Jesus' heart for the poor. And I prayed that same prayer again. Now, I was on coffee that morning. And what happened was that when you were on coffee, just before the service ended, you would pop down to your room and set all the cups out and bring the, the flasks in and, and all that sort of things. So the room that the coffee was served in, it also doubled up as the room that the children were in during the service. So when I got to that room, uh, there were a few secondhand toys kind of scattered about the floor. You know the sorts of toys that you think, oh, I should really take these to the charity shop, but I don't know what to do with them, so oh, I'll give them to church um, rather than bend them. These were the toys, and a few kind of scribbled upon coloring in pictures and some crayons that were just broken up and had seen better days. And here's where it gets interesting. The adults in the room. There was a very frazzled looking kids leader there and a parent who was just there because they had to be. And they were looking at their watches with absolute sheer relief when I walked into the room because when the person you see came to make the coffee, that meant the service was over. And they were just telepathically willing the parents, you know, come and get your children. And they just had enough. And suddenly, right then and there, the Lord spoke to me. And in my heart, I heard him say, here are the poor, Katie. These little ones, just look at them. Because they are in poverty. And I was completely undone. Because you see, the children in our church, they were not poor in the material sense of the word. But in the world of our church, these children were absolutely spiritually poor. And nobody seemed to have realized um, at all, least of all me. And you see, what had happened in our church and every other church that I have been a part of before that was that there was a culture where care of children had become a burden to the church. Now, as a child in the church that I grew up in, I actually knew that we were a burden. I knew it. And nobody ever actually spoke it out to us. Um, it was an unspoken attitude type message that was served up to the children just on a weekly basis. I knew that we were a burden because our leaders were unenthusiastic or parents press ganged into being in a rota and they didn't want to be there. Um, they were new Christians often. They were maybe people who could play keyboards or guitar. Um, not good enough, not well enough to play for the adults so they got sent to the kids rooms because nobody knew what else to do with them. Uh, yep, they, yeah, just unenthusiastic. Um, and that was the picture. And I'm not sure if that was anybody else's experience growing up in church, but so often 
in our churches, the adults, they get the best room, the best worship leaders, the best equipment, the best teachers and speakers, they get the most comfortable chairs. Um, and the children often just get whatever's left over, really. And they're so often the poor in our churches. And that is something that just has made me feel absolutely heartbroken. So a few weeks later, I find myself standing in the same room that the coffee is served in, but with a different agenda. We had a handful of children. You know when you're a small church and you have maybe a three-year-old, a couple of five-year-olds, an eight-year-old, and a ten-year-old? It was that kind of a thing, a big spread of age, um, around six children, um, ranging from preschool till about eight or nine, and I meant business. And I still laugh at that day because I had planned this story on the lost sheep. And from an educational perspective, for any of you teachers out there, I was a teacher, as I've said, it was award-winning to watch. Um, and when I look back on it now, it was hysterical because I drew 100 sheep. I wanted the children to understand what 100 sheep actually looked like. I drew 100 sheep by hand with different facial expressions. It says a lot about my personality, not good things. And well, the room, it looked a treat. And the craft was spectacular. We were making these shape and we had paint and we had glue and all these things that had never been in the room before because it was no more broken crayons for these children. And I was a nightmare. The children, they would be painting their pictures and I would be saying, no, 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 um, don't glue that bit there. And oh, don't paint your sheep yellow or purple. It's meant to be white. And panicking and oh, it's very stressful when three-year-olds do not do the craft the way you want them to do it. <laughs> and I would like to tell you that I spent the last 20 minutes of that lesson doing something really holy, like praying for the children or teaching them more, but I actually fixed their pictures for the last 20 minutes so that the parents would think I was doing a good job. Now, I didn't realize that's what I was doing, but that was what I was doing. So, yes, by the end of it, I actually just felt so wrecked, so tired, and I hadn't met with Jesus, neither had any of the children particularly at all. And I remember just sitting there and I looked down at the paint smudges upon my lovely dress and the toys on the floor. And I could hear in the background the rest of the adults worshiping. And all, all that I could think about at that point was about how right now I could be in the other room with the adults getting some prayer ministry, which is what I absolutely needed. And I remember saying to God, you cannot seriously want me to do this. And do you know, we only had around five or six kids at that time. And do you know, I, I remember leaving that morning and I thought, right, seriously, sorry to the children here, I do not think this now, you'll hear soon. But I left that room thinking that the children's ministry must be somewhere that you got sent just to shrivel up and die spiritually. And I thought maybe, maybe at a push I could handle a rota where I served maybe once a month at the most. But the thought of being there every single week, I just felt, you know, like tantamount to spiritual suicide. And I went back and forth with God on this. And I remember telling him that I didn't mind leaving teaching to plant a church or be a pastor, or write sermons, or speak, or any of those things, but not this. And the whole time, you know, the Lord just whispered in my heart, come with me to the children. And here's what I hadn't realized yet. This wasn't meant to be a program to occupy the kids while the adults get down to what's really important. This was actually church. And the thing is, if we feel like by being in the kids' rooms, we miss church. We have got to take responsibility for the fact that every single kid in those rooms also miss church too. So we've got to ask God to put in us a really deep longing to give our children as good a church experience as the grown-ups have. We need to equip our kids to do the things of the kingdom so that nobody ever again misses church. 
Do you know what? When I was a child, I had everything that I ever could have wanted. I was from a really, just a lovely family. I had a really nice school. I had great friends. Everything that I ever could have wanted or needed, except for one thing, and that is that I wish that I knew Jesus. I really wish when I was a child that I had have known Jesus, and I mean really known him. Um, not just about him, um, but known how to talk to him, how to reach out to him, um, how to touch him, and how to love him with my whole heart. And this is the Jesus that we have to, as the church, communicate to our children. And that is something that I can be absolutely consumed with. And we started with around the six kids. We have around 120 now. Um, we haven't done anything special ourselves, but we have just realized that children are intrigued by Jesus. Of course they are. He is completely fascinating. He is intriguing. And they are not going to come back for good leaders. They won't even keep coming back for a fun program or great games. They will come back when they have been face to face with Jesus and because they are changed forever because of who he is and who he says they are. So one day, um, I was reading through Acts 2 um, when Peter is addressing the crowd at Pentecost. And I had a revelation about what was really missing from our children's ministry. One of the first things that Peter says is this. I think we maybe have the slide. Um, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And later on, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It is for you and your children. And believe me, the Lord, he's already called many of our children here. You know, um, I guarantee if we were to ask the children now um, if God has called any of them to missions, we will have hands raised because he often calls people as little children um, and we don't even realize it. Okay. There are absolutely no categories in the question no age categories in the question of who can receive and be used by God. And we can expect our children to be fully involved in the ministry of the Spirit. There was this one day I was driving home from work and just praying in my car for the children in our church. And while I was praying, I felt the Lord give me a very clear picture. And I could see all the kids in our vineyard kids having ministry time. And when I looked at their faces, they were just all really messy and covered in big gray smudges and their clothes looked really grubby and crumpled up. So I asked God what the picture was about and, um, you know, why why they were so um, messy because it felt a very negative thing. Um, And as I thought about it, um, the picture became clearly to me. And I asked God why the children in it were so dirty and messed up. And God showed me that it wasn't dirt covering the children. It was lots of fingerprints. And I instantly felt God say to me, you know, these are my fingerprints. My mark is on these little ones. And it might look messy when they're doing ministry. It might feel a little bit awkward sometimes when we adults are used to praying a whole paragraph and they say, arm be better. And we're very awkward and we don't know how to to deal with that. It might feel messy or awkward, but God's authority and his love is all over them. It's all over this. And I remember at the time feeling like I was having a heart attack and feeling just actual pain Um, in my chest, and I just remember weeping as I just realized the truth um, that God had spoken to me and the realization of how much pain God feels when we don't see his little ones as he intends. And you know, I just feel that, um, you know, I can still hear him whispering when I take time to listen and I look at, at the kids. If you've kids nearby, you right now, you can just look at them. You know, and I just hear God whispering, do you see what I see? Do you hear 
what I hear when this child speaks? You know, do you feel what I feel? We talked earlier about, you know, asking Jesus how he felt when he lifted those children onto his knee. Do you feel what he feels? Our kids are covered in handprints of holiness. And this is not to deny that kids and adults alike can be irreverent. Um, but we have to see them and bless their infinite possibility for holiness first. One week in, in Vineyard Kids, some of our children were running around the room and it was actually ministry time. And in my head, it was meant to be the calm and peaceful um, part of the morning. And the leaders were just looking on a bit helplessly as the kids chased each other around the room. They were having great fun. But I just felt when I prayed about it that the Lord said it was water on the altar and that we were to pray anyway and just keep going. So we just started praying over the kids in the room um, without even um, explaining what we were doing. And the next minute, two of the children were lying on the floor and one of the children started speaking in tongues. And it was totally messy because the rest of them were still actually running. And, do you know, it's messy and it's holy at the same time. And I am honored and humbled that every single week I get to be in God's presence because I am spending time in their presence. And, you know, the question is, what are you doing to ensure that every child that steps through the door of your church has a life shot through with the reality and the power of Jesus Christ? That's got to be our heartbeat in the vineyard. So let me tell you some stories of things that are happening with our children at the minute in Belfast. So in March this year, we took our older primary school age children away on retreat. And on the Saturday, we went into the little town nearby where we were staying. We were in a big castle. And this was our 7 to 11 year old. And we went into the town to pray, a lot like our teenagers here have been doing today. And our kids were looking to find someone to pray with. Um, who the, the, the first thing they felt was that, that we would pray for someone who was in a red coat. Um, so we, off we went on a hunt for this person. And another group of kids, they were leaving notes on cars to encourage people. And we stood in a bunch beside this, this big long street and we prayed, you know, who, God, would you just show us who needs some encouragement? The children pointed at a gold colored car that was about halfway down the street and they said, you know, somebody in that car needs encouragement, empty car. So we got some, we bought a little card in the shop actually and they started to write a note and we prayed, you know, because the children you know, they totally understood that we didn't know who owned that car, but God did. So they prayed and they just asked, God, would you show us what we need to, to write to this person? And immediately one of our children, who is seven, she said, um, the Lord is showing me that this person is nervous, was the word she used. And he wakes up every morning feeling anxious day after day. So they wrote um, this in a note. Uh, leaving it, you know, to leave on the car. And just before they could pop the note in the car, the man who owned it arrived back. So we stood here with this note. I am a total chicken. I was ready just to kind of run and say, oh, it's too late now, he's back. But the kids ran towards him and, you know, they said, we've just been praying for you. Is there anything we can pray? And the man just looked at them and he said, I am so nervous and anxious which is just, they had the card and it, it said it on it. And what had happened was there was a, a fishing, all the Northern Ireland people here will remember this, there was a fishing accident um, where some fishermen were lost at sea and they hadn't recovered some of the bodies. And basically this man, his best friend was still missing at sea. And he said that every single morning he woke up feeling nervous and anxious, just waiting for news. And could we please pray? And he said he was off to a meeting with everyone from the fishing club because nobody knew what to do. And he said, I never thought about praying. So off he went to tell them all with his card that they should pray. Um, it was amazing. So next, the children. <laughs> The next, the next thing that they were looking for was their person in a red coat. And we passed so many people wearing red coats that day. And I was like, is that them? Is that them? It was pouring with rain. Um, so we were quite keen to get back for lunch. And 
finally they pointed at a man in the distance and said, that's the man, that's him. So he walked down the road and he was on the opposite side of the road, so he was crossing over and as soon as he got to our side, he was surrounded by children who were like, oh, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, can we pray for you? And he looked completely overwhelmed is the truth. And they said, can, can, do you need prayer? And he kind of looked a bit taken back, so I stepped in and explained, like, these children, they just really wanted to pray for you, and they felt that God said there'd be someone in a red coat, and we think maybe that's you. Is there something? So he just, his eyes started to fill with tears, and he told us that his wife had cancer, and that she was just in the hairdressers beside where we were standing, because they were trying to do something with her hair. And he asked us, would we just pray that he could be the husband that she needed? And our little children, our seven, eight, nine, and ten-year-olds, were just laying hands on this man. And he stood weeping, just praying that God would give him the strength that he needed to support his wife. And he just, he just said at the end of it, he said, I have no boxes for what just happened, but thank you. <laughs> so, awesome stuff. We have another little girl, and she is 10, and she um, really just prays all the time that her friends would become Christians, and she went on her school trip. They were away in, I think, Scotland for four days, and uh, on the first night, she said to her friends, excuse me, but I pray at bedtime, so could I just have um, a few minutes, and she prayed. Um, just as she would every night. And then the next night, some of her friends were asking her about, you know, what is this that you do? So she said, well, I, I talk to God every night. Do you want to come and listen? So they came and listened. And the third night, it was four nights, the third night, they said, are we having that prayer meeting? So they came and they sat with her and they prayed. And on the last night, she led two of them to Jesus. So it's awesome. So th this is what it's about. Earlier this year, we decided to try a new thing out in our toddler room. Well, at the, one of the age groups I'm absolutely passionate about are our babies and toddlers. Um, and the fact that we need to do ministry with them now and expect the Holy Spirit to fall upon them. Um, and yep, we decided to try out a new thing with our little children. And... We pray for our toddlers every week on a Sunday, uh, but we never encourage the children themselves to pray, mainly because about half of them, they're one and two year olds, and you know, they don't have speech yet, so you have to do ministry a little bit differently. Uh, but our leaders in that room, they have been teaching the little ones to lay hands on their friends and invite the Holy Spirit to come, so we were just teaching our two year olds, you know, you can just say, Holy Spirit, come and then they would copy us and lay hands on their friends. And this was last autumn, so maybe some of you have heard this story. But the first week we asked who wanted prayer, and a little boy who was two at the time was first in the queue, and it was quite an obvious one because he had a broken leg, and his leg was in plaster, and all his little friends laid hands on him and prayed that his leg would be healed, and they just said, Jesus, make it better. Amen. And you know, nothing dramatic happened, but shortly afterwards, another little child bumped their head, and the next minute, the child with a broken leg is pulling his plastered leg across the floor and laying hands on his other friend on the sore head and saying, Jesus, make it better. Two years old. And we have children two and three in that room asking for prayer that Jesus would help them to get out of nappies and start wearing big girl pants, big boy <laughs> pants. And do you know what's funny, but it's, it's amazing because actually that's what they need some help with when they're two. That is, when you're two, that's one of the biggest things or three that's going on in your life. So they're coming up and saying, would you just pray about this? So every single week that is mainly what we pray in the toddler room. So yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Um, I love it. I love it. They understand, you know, that Jesus is interested in their life and that actually he wants to help them. And we have parents arrive and saying, have you been praying again? <laughs> you know, because it's really going well. And oh, it's brilliant. So um, another week more recently, we thought we'd see what happened if we tried to take time to listen to God with the children in that room. And I had no idea if it was completely crazy. I was happy could see that we could teach children to pray for their friends, but to hear God speak, 
I just wasn't sure how that would work with toddlers. Uh, again, the speech problem, you know. Uh, so I said to the leaders, right, we're going to try this out. And, you know, I fully believe that God can speak to them. They may not be able to communicate that, but in a way that's relevant to them. So we're going to do it anyway. And if it's crazy, it's crazy. We'll not do it again. So we went in and we prayed that God would put pictures from him in our minds. And it was really, really simple. You know, we... We taught, we'd actually taught, this sounds the craziest story ever to teach toddlers. We taught them on Paul's vision of the Macedonian man, but we didn't call it that. We talked about how Paul was in bed asleep, so they all lay on the floor, all these little ones under this blanket, and then every so often we were getting them to pop up and be like Paul and say, God, give me a picture. So we taught them all about it, and we prayed for them and said, God, would you give each girl and boy a special picture that is from you and then we just said you know did anybody get a picture <laughs> thinking what will happen the first kid he put his hand up and he said that God had shown him his daddy and God said I, I, I give your daddy a new thing today and his dad was at the back of the hall and we all just laid hands on him and his, I mean, he was just weeping um, and just prayed that God would do a new thing in his life. Another little girl had a picture of her home, and she told us that God said to me, Lucy, here is your home, and I am in it. So it's brilliant. She needed to know that. And then finally, um, we had another little one, and he said, God, give me a picture of my mouth and my tummy and my two knees. And he went on, not my one knee, my two knees. So we said, well, you know, what do you think God's saying? This was the day before his third birthday, this child. And he said, Father God, go right down through my mouth, through my tummy, down past my two knees. And he said, Jude, I give you something new to eat and something to drink special from me. So we just laid hands on this two-year-old and prayed that God would give him some food and drink that was from him and that he would refresh him. And he just stood there and let us pray for him. And, you know, we just watched the spirit just fall and fill him up. And guys, this is the, the one and the two and the three-year-olds. And, you know, this is normal life now. This only started a few months ago, but this is normal life in our church for our toddlers. They're now just praying every week. It's like standing around their friends. Who wants prayer? Everybody on their feet in a big queue. Um, and, you know, to think that we nearly didn't do that lesson because I wasn't sure it was even possible. So we need to know as a vineyard movement that a new generation is being raised up. And this is a generation that is marked by new things. We are having a building campaign at the minute for we would dearly love a building of our own in Belfast and Andy, our senior pastor, had announced to the church that we were going to start this fund and have a, a giving day. And the following Sunday, some of our five, six and seven year olds came to church and they emptied out their money boxes and they quite literally gave everything that they had um, and it was prophetic of how the Lord has marked this generation that is growing up in our churches now with kindness and generosity in a quite remarkable way. If we mention compassion or um, food poverty to our little ones, the tins come in. They're spending their pocket money. We're having children that are asking, could they not have birthday presents because they want their friends to bring tins of food? Um, instead, there is a compassion, a, a level of compassion and kindness and generosity that marks this next generation in a very, very unique way. And we don't want to just, as churches, think, how will we improve our children's ministry? We'll throw some money at it and, you know, buy some new toys and make some cosmetic changes. Not that that stuff isn't good, because we need good quality, quality resources too. Um, but we can't make some cosmetic changes and call it revolutionary. Um, we need to invest what we have in helping these kids run hard and fast after Jesus, for they are fearless in mission 
and they are fearless in generosity. Those kids who bring their pennies to church, their coins to church, um, are the same kids that God is positioning to fund missions that will impact people in their thousands. I have no doubts. Um, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Those kids who ran through that town telling people that God loves them and praying for that man whose wife had cancer, um, they are a generation of people who are fearless and who are unashamed to tell this world what Jesus has done for them because it is the power of God that brings salvation. And there are weeks when we ask the Holy Spirit to fall on our children from the tiniest ones up, and you can actually see the kids shiver visibly because his presence touches them and he's meeting their needs. And I know then, in my own heart, that it is the spirituality of our childhood that we adults most need to have restored. Let's read together from Luke. I want to, to do a short teaching that's about John the Baptist. Um, so I'm just going to read it. should be. It's on the screen. This is Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So when do we start praying for the Holy Spirit to minister in the life of a child? Do you know this passage shows us that the answer is while they're in the womb before birth. So if there are any pregnant ladies here, um, you really need to get prayer tonight for your baby. We want to do that. Um, we pray in our church that the presence of God would flood through our children before they're even born. And John the Baptist um, responded to Jesus when Mary talked to his mother. And Elizabeth, she didn't get just a nice little peaceful feeling inside her tummy, but he actually leapt in response. And, you know, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Isn't that awesome? Do you know, before John had even been conceived, the angel Gabriel says to Zachariah, his father, in verse 15, he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. It's awesome. He will be a joy and a delight to you. That's also awesome. Isn't that just exactly what we want to speak over every child before they are born? You know, pregnant ladies... Um, and husbands of pregnant ladies. Do you know, we need to pray that and speak that over our unborn children. You will be a joy and a delight. That's the truth. Um, and this verse tells us that John the Baptist um, was filled with the Spirit from the womb. And this makes me want to get praying for some babies. Um, we pray for our babies. Um, we have prayed for babies who cannot sleep. And um, parents are reporting that they're getting some sleep finally and when you're a parent of a newborn this is big in your life when your baby who isn't sleeping starts to sleep and we are having um, parents who are not Christians who we've gotten to pray for reporting this back and being like wow you know I'll have some more prayer for my baby um, we are having children who are sick be healed, our little babies. We, um, we had one um, little one that we prayed for, um, and she was just really quite new, actually. And as we invited the Holy Spirit to come, she started to giggle. And then her parents started to laugh. It's like, we've never seen her laugh before. This is new. And it was the Holy Spirit falling on her. Um, it was really fun, a lot of fun. Um, if you watch really carefully as you're praying for babies, you can completely see them respond to the Holy Spirit because they were made to respond to him. Um, it's really, really awesome. Uh, yeah, 
our babies. We love it on a Sunday. We have people that come into our baby room. We have about 16 babies in that room. And one of our staff members comes in when she needs to chill out. Who ever thought you'd come to a baby room to do that? Because it is the room that she can most feel the Holy Spirit moving in. Um, and that is really, really exciting. We had a, a one-year-old who didn't have speech yet that was um, in a worship time, and she started to sing really, really loudly. She didn't have speech yet. She was singing in tongues. Um, and we want to see that stuff all of the time in our rooms. So what happens when John is born? Let's skip down to verse 59. Um, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Isn't that so exciting? Do you know, um, this is like all the little villages in the towns. The birth of John, obviously God was so in it that it became the talk of the towns and villages. Everyone was like, have you heard? Do you know, who then can this child be? What is God doing? How awesome is that? Um, you know, it's a great question to ask as well. What then is this child going to be? And in the story, it's the neighbors who ask this question, but in our churches, it's you and I who need to be asking this question. Well, what then is this child going to be? Every new baby that's born, you ask God. What then is this child going to be? Who do you say that they are? And the Holy Spirit will answer you. And there is something very, very powerful about listening to God on behalf of a tiny child. And it feels kind of risky, right? Because you can't read facial expressions, okay? You can't ask them what's going on. And when it's not your child, there's only so much you can know or learn about their little personality and the R that you've got with them. So you've got to be... 100% reliance on God um, and on revelation. And you can't check out what you think God is saying with the child. You have to go find their parents and leave it with them to discern the truth. But there's something very, very powerful happens when a parent has someone tell them that they have been praying for their baby all morning. And then here is what I think the Lord says about your child. Whenever we do a baby dedication, um, we seem to get a lot of, of people with babies that visit who don't go to church because they're coming to see the dedication. And when they pick their babies up from our room and we, we share prophetic words, it is just to watch their faces. They're so receptive to the Lord because they're just desperate to know what he says about their child and have everything that is good for their baby happen. And whether they believe in God or not, you can just tell they know this is a good thing and they want more of it. Yeah. So what then does Zechariah say about his son? Okay, all you dads out here can listen to this. Um, he starts to praise and prophesy over his son's life. So let's just look from verse 76 onwards. And you, my child will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Verse 80, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. I say, not a bit of wonder <laughs> with that prayed over him. Um, as David Walters, he so aptly puts it, we cannot preach salvation messages to infants and expect them to repent and respond to an altar call, but we can minister to their spirits. Their minds may not understand, but because they are spiritual beings, they will respond to the presence of God. 
And that's why we really need you, anointed leaders and followers of Christ, to know the children in your churches. It's not the responsibility of a few people who are in the children's rooms on a Sunday morning. It is the responsibility of the whole church body. And there are people um, in this room right now who are called to be children's leaders and who don't even realize that this counts as real ministry because nobody ever told you. Um, do you know people who would say, I just really love babies. Um, and they're always picking up people's toddlers. When I want to work out who I need to serve in the baby room, I ask all the new parents, who is it that wants to hold your baby every week? Um, because that will be the person. And do you know, people who love really little kids think that everybody does um, and don't understand that actually it's a really special thing, do you know, and perhaps they just need someone to tell them that maybe, you know, did God call you to pastor babies? And it's like a revelation. Babies need pastors too. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's in Jeremiah. We need to hear God's call on our churches to pastor and minister in power to our children from newborn, unborn babies right the whole way through. We need to create space where children can feel the real presence of God, where we can pray over them, where we can listen to God for them, where we can read scripture over them, we can worship over them. We need to saturate the children in our churches with his presence. For if they can respond to Jesus in their spirits before birth, how much more so when they have been born? Later, when John the Baptist has grown up and he enters his ministry, he is asked who he is. And his answer, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Do you hear that? He knows exactly who he is. And how does he know it? He has been told who he is for his entire childhood by his parents and probably by half the neighborhood by the sounds of it, um, probably others. This, this man, John the Baptist, from birth has been prayed over, he has been prophesied over by his parents and now as an adult he knows exactly who he is and exactly what he's been made to do and here he is walking about confidently telling people it's me. I'm the voice of one calling in the desert. That man prophesied about in the scriptures long ago. That was about me. And some of us, don't we have identity crisis as adults? You know, and we, we spent so much time um, as churches trying to help um, our adults and us as adults figure out the answer to the question, who am I and why have you put me here on this earth? And how about that we could raise our children in such a way that they would never have to spend um, a number of their adult years in counseling or trying to figure these things out because they know exactly who Jesus says they are without any shadow of a doubt. What about the children in your churches? The children in your neighborhoods? Do they know who God says they are? Because this is transformational. If the kids you come into contact with could really, really get this deep down in their hearts and minds, your towns and your cities will be changed forever because of this. And in the vineyard, we want to raise children who know with absolutely, absolute certainty, like John the Baptist did, who they are in Christ. My vision is to see the face of kids' ministry completely transformed um, across the vineyard movement. And I remember God showing me what our churches could look like if our children really hungered after Jesus, I mean really knew Jesus intimately, heard his prophetic voice, could confidently pray for healing and worship him as a way of life. And I felt God showing me that without the children in our churches living lifestyles that look like this, our churches are only running on half power because only half of the body is functioning fully. It's not okay for just the adults to carry our churches forward. 
it's not okay. Um, way back 10 years ago when I started, I went to a conference and there was um, a lady at it um, who shared what is quite a disturbing picture. She saw a body and the leg had been cut off and thrown into an adjoining room. And as the leg began to shrivel up and die, the very lifeblood began to drain out of the rest of the body. It became weak, it was disabled, it couldn't work the way God had planned for it to work. And that is the reality of this situation. You put the children out of the way in another room and forget about them and we don't provide for them properly, then not just the children, but actually the rest of the church becomes weakened too and starts to function way, way outside of its full potential. If we don't fully include the children in our churches, we are going to lose a generation because instead of building on our foundations, they'll just start something new. It's the truth of it. If our kids are bored in our churches, they're just going to walk right on out the doors as soon as they're old enough and go somewhere else where the Holy Spirit is moving and they can be part of instead. And just imagine that our kids, we have an incredible legacy in the vineyard movement. Just imagine that our children could stand on that legacy that we already have in the vineyard because they feel so much a part of things that they don't have to start from scratch like we did. If the children in our churches were running hard after Jesus, that would transform not just our movement, but our whole nation. Facilitate our children to run hard after Jesus, and we will see a harvest that is beyond our wildest dreams. We could impact schools, we could impact cities, we will impact governments, and that is what I long to see. So why don't you join me in asking the Lord for that now? I want to finish off by doing one thing. Um, what I would like you to do is just close your eyes for a minute. And I'm gonna ask the Lord to come and give you a picture. I'm gonna pray that he would put a picture in your heads of one child in your church. It might be your own child if you're a parent. It could be somebody else's child. Don't have to be a parent to do this. So let's pray. Father, would you come, Holy Spirit? Thank you that you love the children in our churches. You adore them. Would you just come now, Jesus? Holy Spirit, come. And would you um, release your word across this room, release pictures across this room? I ask that you would place a picture of a child in the mind of every single person here. Just come, Lord, and do that. I just want you where you're sitting, just quietly, to ask the Lord what he says about that child that you're picturing. Just say, Jesus, who do you say this child is? Who do you say this child is that I'm thinking of right now? Ask, ask Jesus to show you how that child feels. Okay, you can open your eyes. We just want to really get God's heart for, for all the children in our churches, but for the children that you, you pictured right now, what I challenge you to do is that in this next week, you go find that child, you tell that child that you prayed for them, and this is what the Lord says. And I'm not sure how many people we have at this conference, but that's a lot of children in your churches that probably for the first time will have an adult walk up to them, explain that they prayed for them during the week and share prophetic words. And that, that's where it starts. And you see, when you've done that this week, you go and you ask the Lord to show you one more child in your church, and then the next week you find them, and you do the same thing. And if you do that on repeat, 
you will see a harvest. That is so exciting. And you'll start to get the prophetic word of God into the lives of children. And then what will happen is they'll come up to you and they'll start saying, could you pray for me this week about such and such? And it becomes very relational. And it starts a really exciting thing off. So, so hopefully you're up for the challenge and you can find a child and, and do that. Let's get the heart of the Father for all the children in our churches. He really doesn't want to lose any of them. God and Satan have very different agendas for those children that you're picturing. Very different agendas. What's Satan's agenda for the children that you're picturing? It's not great. But what's God's agenda? We've got to get on our knees and we have got to get God's agenda for each child in our church. God desires right now to give you a vision for individual children in your churches. Do you want to know who a really great kids leader with an amazing vision for children was? Jesus. He was the best children's leader there was. Um, he sat down and those children wanted to be with him. They came and they sat on his knee and they knew that he wanted them around. See how they didn't run to the other disciples? They kind of overlooked them. They kind of knew, but they knew that Jesus wanted, wanted them with him and he lifts them onto his knee and he prays for them and he blesses them. And that's what I want to be like. That's what we need to do. If you don't know how to pray for children in your churches, um, we talked about this in the seminar earlier. We gotta say, Jesus, show me how you felt that day you lifted that child onto your knee. And would you put those feelings in me? I'd like to do some ministry now. Um, my wonderful friend Jenny's here with me from Belfast. Do you want to come on up? <laughs>